Hello and welcome to the latest presentation of the Rift Valley webinar series. My name is Anne Kruijt and I'm the host for today's talk. Today's speakers are Jeroen van Ravenhorst and Nicolas Lotman. Jeroen is a research master student of linguistics at Leiden University. He is interested in the documentation, description and history of the languages of Southern Ethiopia. His thesis is on the linguistics of human to animal interaction in Hamar, a South Amatic language. Nicolas is currently a bachelor student in linguistics at Leiden University, and he will start his master's in the autumn also at Leiden University. For his thesis, he is investigating the aspectual system of El Hombe, a Bantu language spoken in Malawi, but he is also interested in various topics in anthropological linguistics. Please join me in welcoming Jeroen and Nicolas as they give their talk, Revitalizing Documentary Archives, Exploring Methods of Digital Distribution. Yes, thank you very much, Anna, for the introduction. And hello, everyone. My name is Jeroen van Avenhorst, and I'm here with Nicholas. Hello, I'm Nicholas. <laughs> yeah, and so today our talk is about revitalizing documentary archives. And before we start, I want to give a little background on how we got into this topic. So back in December last year, um, we attended a, um, a workshop by the African Study Center here in Leiden on uh, archiving. Um, and it was a collaboration between uh, LUCL and Africa Study Center. And at that workshop, Martin Maus presented um, a talk um, titled 50 Ways to Share My Iraqi Data. Um, and I think this is an, uh, he presented an issue that is very familiar to a lot of researchers who've been in the field for a long time, um, who are sitting on a lot of valuable data um, and wondering how they can share that with communities, data that's very valuable and will be appreciated by communities and can assist in um, efforts to uh, to develop language or to revitalize language. Um, so Martin um, said that, uh, asked the question, how do people want these materials to be presented to them? Um, and one thing that the people said is that they don't want books. Um, so books are kind of a thing of the past. Um, and also now that we have multimedia, um, like video with audio and, and options for subtitling, um, multimedia outputs have the preference because it's much closer to reality and um, caters to a, lot, to a much broader audience. Um, and also it's more flexible because um, multimedia video can be um, freely shared, duplicated, and once you get it out there, it can in infinitely spread to anyone who's interested. Um, but we want to talk about the ways of how to go about that. Um, yeah, Nicholas. Yeah, and uh, we just uh, thought that in that moment we saw that uh, some of these issues these researchers were voicing and uh, did not know what to do. We felt like just by virtue of that we are young, we know something more about digital media because we really have grown up really in the middle of it, in the middle of uh, social media, especially. And uh, we thought that we would try to voice our thoughts on how they could contribute to uh, yeah, better documentary linguistics. Yeah, so to start with, uh, we'll give a brief outline of what the components of language documentation are. Um, then we go over some examples from the ELAR archive um, and see, yeah, the the good things that have been done, but also raise some of the issues that we uh, have encountered. Um, and then we give our suggestions for mobilization of documentary outputs. And finally, we'll have some discussion of what has been said. So a brief overview of the components. Um, these are uh, given by Austin, Peter Austin in 2010 uh, in current issues in language documentation. And he lists, lists these five crucial components of language documentation, starting with recording, which is um, being in the field and um, recording media and text in, in context. The next step is to transfer them to a computer where um, you can go to the next step to add value. So segmenting, transcribing, translating, and uh, glossing um, the recordings. And this can be done with uh, software such as Elan or Flex. 
Um, and something to note here is that not all uh, recordings um, should be or uh, are feasibly uh, annotated because some projects might have way more recordings um, than can ever be annotated. And this is not a problem um, as long as a good portion, a sizable portion of it uh, is, is well annotated, but usually more recordings uh, is, is better for, for the eventual outcomes, uh, regardless of whether it's annotated or not. Uh, then the archiving step is um, getting your whole collection that has been annotated or not uh, and assigned metadata and transferring this to the archive where it stays for forever, hopefully, um, and assigning them uses rights. So here we have a little screenshot from Andrew Harvey's archive from uh, of Gorwa from 2017, uh, which shows the, the respective folders with their names, uh, the titles, and also their access rights. Um, and then the last step, and this goes from the archive. So this uses the materials that you find in the archives uh, is to mobilize uh, those outputs. So that means, uh, as Austin puts it, the creation, publication, and distribution of outputs in a range of formats for a range of different users and uses. Um, and actually, uh, not much has been elaborated on this last step. Um, which is the reason why we're focusing on this component in our talk. So we did try to uh, scavenge the literature for what has been said about it. And these are the references that we found. So most are from the book Essentials of Language Documentation from 2006. Uh, so Himmelmann uh, said something about it in the first chapter, but also not very much. Uh, most definitions um, are limited to one or two sentences. And there is no real, um, no real descriptions of how to go about it in in practical ways, um, and these articles don't really address, or at least not in detail, the issue of how to how do we create media that the users want uh, and can consume. Um, and perhaps we have missed some references here, uh, and if we did, uh, we'll be happy if you could let us know. Uh, yeah. So now we are going to look at some uh, quotes from the ALR guidance for applicants. So we just want to highlight how uh, we think that mobilization is a central part of language documentation, but that is also something that is part of the funding. So oftentimes an issue is that people say like, yes, but the funding doesn't want me to do this. ALR wants us to do mobilization. So. First of all, in the guide for applicants, they say applicants are strongly encouraged to create documentation in ways that assist communities to maintain and strengthen their languages. Well, here the assisting uh, to maintain and strengthen their languages. This is specifically where uh, linguistic fieldwork data can be especially useful because that is what can be used to create educational materials or whatever content that people desire to consume in their own language. Then another aspect is uh, yeah, practical aspects of ethical uh, practice include sharing outcomes with the community. Once again, they also say that it, it is almost, uh, it is unethical. I completely agree here, unethical to not mobilize the data. And finally, they want the mobilization to be part of your budget. They say that include costs of supporting community involvement in your budget. Yeah, so, before we get into some of the examples, we thought that it would be uh, adequate or important to say who are we addressing or who is this presentation for. So we touched on that before earlier, but first of all, this is not a blame game that we are trying to play. We are not pointing fingers that, hey, you did this badly or this should have been done that way or this way. Uh, we acknowledge that there has been what we say rapid unforeseeable change. So uh, 20 years ago, you may not have, uh, YouTube was created, but it was not uh, feasible to know that, oh, this will be a good place to put your documentation data. Maybe you could have known that 10 years ago. So if you started a project 10 years ago, you could have started doing that. But uh, short form content has only been popular for maybe the past five, four years. So, and if we think of uh, how long our research cycles, so if there's a project and it lasts four or five years, 
then it's very difficult to uh, accommodate something that has become uh, apparent 10 years ago or even five years, especially five years ago. You just cannot write that into your project. Uh, so what we are trying to do is we are trying to have an approach that uh, can apply to older projects as well. So it doesn't matter if you're if the data was collected 20 years ago, but we're trying to give suggestions on how to make it, uh, how to mobilize it, how to create outputs in ways that are accessible for communities nowadays. But also, uh, like all steps of language documentation, it is best to know what you're doing from the very start. So if you can keep these things in mind from the very beginning for a new project, then this will also prove helpful uh, in planning out the project. So now can we go to the examples? Yeah, so we're doing three examples here, all from ALAR, uh, ELDP grant, grant applicants. So first of all, the documentation of ARO. Uh, here we see a large set of uh, videos that have been uploaded to YouTube uh, that uh, they are all locally relevant. We went through the list. They are great videos. They talk uh, legends. They are uh, personal histories. There's conversations. It's just uh, all in all great uh, data, very relevant and really showing the language. Uh, some of the recordings lack subtitles, but most of them have subtitles. So if you can see from the slide, there's like these, uh, you can see the subtitles actually hard coded into the video. So this is also an important part. And finally, they are posted in YouTube. And uh, also something to maybe keep in mind that we will mention maybe later is that all of these videos have very much the same image or the same thumbnail of one person sitting in one place, uh, which is fine for the video, but maybe we have some suggestions for that later. Now, second of all, we said that we are not going to be pointing fingers. So this is a project where we found that we could not find any mobilization online. So of course, we don't know if the researcher here has uh, uh, shared the data back with the community in other ways. But uh, just from the digital access, all we could find was the project on ALAR. And uh, some of the, 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 the data is great. It's, of course, very locally relevant. It, had, uh, it was quite a large data set, but uh, a lot of them lacked annotation and they were only accessible on ALAR. And you can already see from the image that we have provided that if you have uh, a lot of a large set of X fables, then even if you know that there's a great interesting st story in there, you don't even know which one to click on. So that makes it very inaccessible and it's not very user friendly. And uh, finally, we have a very good example once again. So documentation of Ifira Mele uh, on Vanuatu. And uh, so there the researcher was approached by the community and asked, hey, you have all this gear. Uh, our daughter is getting married. Can you please uh, film all this process? And the researcher thought, ah, great. I have a great opportunity to get uh, uh, language data, uh, natural language data. And it was a, a long festivity, a long celebration. And uh, she got amazing videos of it. And uh, she then took it to someone who knew how to make a film out of it. She made a film out, he, he made a film out of it. And then she gave the film back to the family. The family was very happy with it. The community was very happy with it. And then she also, uh, of course, with the consent of the community, gave it to the local TV. And it has been aired several several times. And well, we, we watched uh, some of the movie. It's very beautiful. And even you can see in the quote here on the slide that these women are all very happy. I think they were also happy when they were watching the movie. Uh, I also recommend uh, reading the blog post about it. It's uh, very great. It's linked in the slide, yes. So now if we compare all these three projects, uh, what you can see is that they mostly dif differ in terms of uh, mobilization. Like all other aspects of language documentation, they can have done exactly the sa same, but the mobilization is really where they are different. So we see YouTube, we see only accessible on ALR, and we see aired on local TV. So there is no re really no standard of how mobilization should be done. Uh, and we just think that there should be at least some sort of standard, maybe. Uh, so these are the thoughts that we are raising, yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, and so it is therefore our opinion that it is crucial that the documentary linguist recognizes their responsibility beyond compiling and archiving of materials, ensuring that the outputs are accessible for the speaker community. Um, and this emerges mainly in contrast uh, to the example where you can only find materials in ALAR. And so to go back to the second example that we saw, um, some of these materials cannot be mobilized because they are not annotated. Um, and you don't know which ones are annotated or not because that is um, very opaque uh, going into the archive. You have to go into every folder and, in, and every uh, annotation file to see if there are subtitles or not. Um, because it it might not be the documentary linguist who wants to mobilize these um, these materials in the archive in hindsight. Uh, it might be a different researcher because these um these materials are, yeah <laughs> um they are open access so it can be it can be done anytime and the archives just store them indefinitely for any point in the future to use them so now let's go back to austin's definition of mobilization uh and our elaboration of that so uh in the second part of his definition uh, we're going to focus on that first. So he says, uh, outputs in a range of formats for a range of different users and uses. Um, so the outputs um, is what we understand, the media that are created, published, and distributed. Um, and the range of formats can be the different types of media that are uh, published and distributed. Um, so yeah, it, it can, for example, be audio or video um, uh, or text. Um, and then there's different users, uh, which are the community members or even other linguists or academics. So you have to think about who are who am I making this for and um, how should I cater to that audience? Um, and then the last point is different uses, which uh, is about uh, recollection, reclamation, uh, but also research. So how are people going to use those outputs? So we talked about the second part of the uh, definition first because we thought that this is really something crucial that you need to understand to even talk about creation, publication, and distribution. Uh, so this is sort of the background information that uh, has to be there for creating the things. So now to talk about, yeah, creation. Uh, the creation, we see it as, so a lot of the things is as we see it, because it's once again, not really elaborated. The, the definition itself is quite good, but a lot of the things could still be elaborated on as can be probably seen from this presentation. But yes, creation we see as from data to outputs. So first of all, the subtitles have probably been created in the area, in the adding value section, but, uh, sorry. Uh, but uh, there still have to be decisions made with the subtitles. So, for example, are you going to, uh, which language subtitles are you going to put uh, in the file? Are you going to hard code the subtitles? Uh, same goes for the title. What sort of, what language are, languages are you going to include in the title? If it is, it just uh, English? Is it just uh, the native, is it just the target language? Is it maybe uh, free languages? So let's say Iraq. Uh, Swahili and uh, English. So all of these things have to be thought about. Uh, then we saw on YouTube, we saw these images. Uh, we, we call them the thumbnails. Once again, these are uh, great spaces actually to have more information. So maybe if you want to fit all three languages, language titles into the, into the, to be quickly seen, then you can maybe put, for example, Swahili, English in the written text, uh, because that's also what is going to be most likely uh, sought or being used in a search function. And then you can have the Iraq in the image. And you can also fit some other extra information there, because the images are viewed quite big, uh, typically. And then uh, also description. So once again, description should be in all the relevant languages, but it should also have the context for the recording. So where was the recording done? Uh, context of the language. So uh, where is the language in general spoken, but um, what which variety of the language is it? 
uh, then uh, all of this information and the description of the video, once again, you have to think about what languages is this going to be in, what's going to be the order of the languages. Uh, then uh, we think that there should also be the link to the archive. Uh, we will talk about that uh, later a bit more as well. Of course, that should include all the, the description. Uh, if it doesn't include all the necessary keywords already, then you can uh, include at the bottom also a list of keywords, because once again, if the search function is used, it is searching from within the title and within the description. So if uh, it is, let's say, an Iraq uh, poem, then you want that to be said somewhere. And maybe that doesn't isn't right for the title. And actually, the description doesn't also need this. But even still, you should include that at the very bottom. So if somebody is searching Iraq poems, they find this. And uh, once again, the final two points, uh, video length and orientation of outputs. There you need to start thinking about the later things uh, about what is the sort of media that the community likes to use. So for example, if they like short form content, then uh, they are probably on their phones. And uh, that means that they are viewing things vertically and they view rather short videos. If it's for uh, TV, then it, you probably have to think about horizontal media and the longer format. Uh, if it's for a video, then it's sort of middle way, uh, but also uh, horizontal. So you really have to think about what sort of media the community likes to use. Uh, and uh, click, please. And what we also think is that uh, as in the situation right now, we think that students are probably up to, most up to date with uh, the digital media and uh, they may know, know some tricks or some uh, things that have become popular that uh, may not that uh, maybe older researchers let's say martin mouse uh, don't uh, know about so this is a great place to involve a student in your uh, project who is happy to contribute and use really the knowledge about uh, social media and the internet that they have and a great place to collaborate, yeah. And yeah, this is just uh, once again uh, the example where you can see the uh, the from Harvest project. You can see the English and the Swahili, and you can use actually those same texts that you have already created for the archive uh, for the YouTube videos, for example. So this is another important point to highlight that. You saw a lot of those things that I listed previously, but this isn't doesn't necessarily mean that these things have to be created from scratch. So the descriptions that you put on YouTube can probably be the same that are in the metadata. The language the description has to only be written once, and maybe you have already written it for something. So a lot of these things can overlap, but they just need to be there. Yeah, thanks. Um, let's now go over uh, publication in a bit more detail. Um, so the point we want to make is that, um, in the step of publication, you need to take into account localized solutions. Um, so every community is going to be different. Um, some might ha all have phones and good internet connection, but our communities might rely more on radio or uh, television and others might have access to computers. So this all, um, informs what kind of output you want to distribute. As Nicholas said before, if they have phones, maybe vertical short form content is more desirable, but it also um, it also depends on um, on the platforms that people have access to. Um, so Austin in 2020 um, talks about a diverse, diverse outputs over a variety of platforms. And these platforms we understand um, are platforms like YouTube, like Instagram, like Facebook, or uh, even TikTok nowadays. Um, that um, that people have good access to and are actually very uh, skilled in using. So then, if if your whole community is um, is very skilled in using Facebook, then it might be wise to create a Facebook page where you upload these videos and all these materials from taken from the archive and made into a form that's consumable for, for them um, to reach them in the most effective way. Um, and you don't have to limit yourself to just one platform. Um, for example, you can upload um, everything to YouTube, like we saw for the Ado uh, YouTube channel. Um, and these YouTube videos can then be shared again via Facebook, which will lead people back to YouTube where um, everything is centralized. 
Um, so this is what we mean by uh, local solutions. Uh, so they have to be accessible, usable, and uh, digestible. And also spreading them across different platforms. Um, so you have the shorts on YouTube, you have the shorts on TikTok. This in ensures um, that your data will stay out there for a longer time because you never know at what point some platforms might disappear. Um, but distributing it over a variety of platforms gives you this insurance. Now I want to give a little anecdote of when I did my fieldwork in Hamar uh, in southern Ethiopia. Uh, is one guy was walking around with a um, with a Bluetooth speaker uh, all the time, and he was uh, and he had some like recordings. Uh, he had music, but uh, they don't have internet there. They don't have electricity, um, but the speaker had a pretty good battery. Um, so, in this case, it would be very useful uh, to, uh, for example, share a. Um, um, audio files on, on an SD card that can be inserted in the Bluetooth speaker that can then be uh, listened to anywhere, uh, even in the remote areas uh, where people have no other options of like watching video or uh, having an internet connection. Um, so these are just some examples of how to take into account the local solutions of, uh, of public publishing your iPads. Um, then about distribution. Um, so we, uh, for us, distribution and promotion um, denote kind of the same step since we are dealing mainly with digital materials. So once you um, distribute something uh, to an online platform, it also entails promotion. Uh, so promotion is getting awareness for, uh, for the fact that the materials are out there. Um, and uh, yeah, so you have to make the language community aware uh, of the outputs uh, and the goals are to make sure they have online access, but they also have offline access if, that, if that's necessary. Um, and the methods for that is to uh, showcase the outputs to the community. So going there, telling people how to how to access these, these channels, how to find um, the outputs on YouTube, on Facebook, wherever and to share the knowledge of uh, how to get there, how to find the channel. Um, and for this, you need, you need to collaborate with local agents, people who have a voice in the community, who have a big network, and who know who know how to um, excite people to actually use these materials um, and to let them see the value of it. Um, so this can kickstart community agency and distributing output. So once you get the ball rolling, um, yeah things will take off and hopefully go viral. So yes, uh, to quickly sum up or conclude <clears throat> what we have been talking about. So uh, we talked about the five steps uh, of uh, language documentation. So first of all, you do the recording, then you transfer the data, you add the value, you archive the data, and then you mobilize the data. Um, and uh, we really think that uh, if, the mobilization fails. Uh, insufficient mobilization efforts, they impede uh, one of the key goals of language documentation. And as we saw uh, really earlier also in the ALAR guidelines is that to support speakers of endangered languages in their desires to maintain them. So this is also what we all want, right? That if somebody wants to maintain their language, they have, it is possible for them. Yeah, and lastly, we thought it was good to show an example of how to go from creation to mobilization. Um, so here we start um, as an example with an archive. Um, so we go to the archive, we find a folder called Fulig Legend, and we think this would be a nice um, a nice file um, set of files to share with the community, but we have to go from the archive um, using these files to actually reach an output that is consumable for people. Uh, because you cannot send people to the archive and go download all those videos and, and Elon files and uh, let them do the job of figuring out how to uh, put it together. Um, so this is something, um, so this is the step of creation, um, going from the archive to your, um, to mobilizing the, those outputs. Um, so let's start with the file names first. So um, 
some issues that we saw when we were going through archives is that some files don't associate with each other. So when you download the whole set and you want to upload it into, uh, or you want to open it into Elan, uh, some files are not automatically associated with each other because they have different file names. Um, and um, then the file encoding, um, we see some problems where still some ALR archives have MP3 files, which are not the best audio quality. Um, this is mostly concerned with uh, phoneticians who want to use the data, who want to have WAV files for uh, for good phonetic analysis. Um, and also, um, we saw some issues where we opened the EAF file and then uh, what happened is the EF file thought there was a WAV file associated with it, but the archive only contained an MP3 file. So then everything broke down and we had to fix that. Um, yeah. And then um, there were some, uh, some things not clear regarding the contents uh, of the EF file. So uh, some... Uh, when you go into the folder, you don't know what you can expect in the EF file. So some were only segmented, um, the, the videos or the audio. Some were transcribed and some were also translated, but you never know. You have to go in there, match everything together, and then you will see what you would have wanted to know before uh, uh, checking that. Um, so I think this might be a specific problem of ELAR not being clear about what you can expect in those folders in terms of what is transcribed, what is translated. That would be very useful information also for people who want to go in there with the, the intent to mobilize those outputs and find things that are suitable. Um, and just generally, um, uh, Elon is very unsuitable for non-linguists. Uh, so maybe there's um, community activists who know that there's an archive with materials um, that they can use in promoting uh, uh, their language. Um, but of course, we didn't expect them to have knowledge of how to use Elan. Uh, and also there's a lot of variation in how people actually set up their Elan file uh, and actually how to get subtitles uh, from those Elan files. Um, so our advice is actually to also include SRT files in the archive, if that's possible, um, to to skip this this obstacle, this step. Um, yeah. So, and on the topic of extracting subtitles, um, some archives use very narrow transcription, uh, which all have to be uh, revised before they can be used in presenting it in a in a in a way uh, that matches the orthography of a language, if there is any. Um, so that, that's just a little thing to keep in mind. Um, of course, we don't expect every language to have an orthography or a linguist to, to develop one because that's a whole other complex issue. Um, but also, um, if you want to export those, uh, those files, then, um, we ran into some issues where, um, the tiers were not associated correctly. So it was actually impossible to export the translations and the transcriptions uh, together. Um, uh, which basically made it impossible to, um, it's, to get from your archive to any reasonable outputs um, uh, without uh, needing the skills of a programmer. So ideally, we would have uh, this kind of archive where all the files are ready. Um, then the only step we have to do is um, associate the, the audio with the video and uh, and burn in the subtitle or have it as a separate file. Um, and then choose the right video length. Maybe you want to change your orientation. Um, and then we go to publication. And that entails uh, selecting the right thumbnail, uh, getting the, the video description. Uh, and this also ties with the selection of uh, the platform. So if you're going to put it um, on Instagram, you're going to have very different requirements than uh, putting it on YouTube. But generally, 
Um, people prefer shorter videos, more clarity about what they can expect uh, in those outputs. Um, uh, and that should also be uh, uh, encouraged by uh, local actors who can um, maybe give context around these outputs uh, and distribute them appropriately. Then lastly, some discussion points um, about ethical concerns, um, which there might be in sharing all those outputs with, uh, with basically anyone. Um, since the, um, the files are uploaded to the archive and they are open access, in our opinion, uh, those ethical questions concern an earlier stage in the documentation process. So once it has been uploaded to the archive, um, then anyone should be able to do with it what they want and uh, distribute it to anyone uh, since they are often um, given open access rights. Um, so that's something we don't think is relevant for um, the last step of language uh, of mobilization in documentary linguistics, but we'd also like to hear your thoughts on that. Um, and then uh, there was this issue with um, the archive being concealed. Um, so Nicholas, maybe you can say something about that. Yeah, so we actually had a discussion amongst ourselves uh, about that. Uh, you mentioned that you cannot find uh, the documentation projects if you search it on Google. And I think it's a, a good thing. So I think that it is uh, maybe nice if some of the data is open access, but there is this sort of gray area where you really have to know where to look for it. So you really have to be interested to get to the archive and uh, click on the things and uh, get, yeah, and have it, uh, to have it. Uh, so yeah, this is the main point here. Yeah, and also the archive um, is very hard to navigate. So we don't really expect anyone that is not a linguist to go into those archives. It doesn't really cater to that, to to anyone else. Um, and we don't know if this is the the point of the archive. Um, and also if if archives should consider maybe opening themselves up for um for another audience, um, for community members that want to use those materials uh to uh to help their community to spread the word about their language um yeah and then uh so that's the question who's the archive for yeah and this actually leads directly into the next thing so maybe now i'm going a bit against myself but uh, i actually do think that the uh, mobilization should start from the archive so as Jeroen uh, said, that archives are technical and uh, difficult to navigate. And also, if you've been on ARAR, then it's a very slow website. And uh, first of all, if it's a slow website, it's difficult to navigate on its own. And then if the researcher hasn't put in the effort to make the things easily accessible. So once again, if you have a list of X stories the, or culture stories, then you don't know how to find anything. It really tries to fend off everybody who is interested. So our thought is maybe archives could have a sort of simple view uh, where you turn it on and then it is loading in less stuff. So that would also probably make the page itself quicker. But also it doesn't need to show you the EAF files, for example. Or if you have really complex uh, metadata in a really specific format, once again, you don't need to include that if the metadata is, uh, in, in the case of ALAR, it is also already in the in the folder description, <clears throat> I think, yeah. Uh, yeah, and then uh, now we also think that the, the archives could have featured media, for example, like in DOPES. So once again, bringing it a step closer to mobilization. So here on DOPES, you just click on the video and you already get access to some sort of data that uh, you can see, and then you can click on the people and uh, read about the people and read about the project that was done and uh, what sort of materials it has. So it is already bringing you into the project and you can already know what is there, 
And in ALR, it is much more difficult to access, though a lot of that information is also present there. And now if we go on. And uh, yeah, and this we think also would make linking to the archive a much more important step. So right now, uh, Jeroen sort of mentioned how YouTube can become a sort of a central hub for all the data, but ideally it would the central hub would be the archive because that would have the most concise and most information about uh, all of the data and the project itself. And uh, if the archive is more accessible, more navigable, then it makes a lot more sense to link to the archive and the archive can play a bigger role. But this is also something we want to hear your thoughts on uh, very badly. We're very interested in what you think of the archives and yeah, mobilization. Yeah, and then to conclude, just some takeaways. Um, so our approach to mobilization is mainly concerned with digital distribution. Of course, there are many other ways to mobilize documentary outputs. Um, as was said before, there can be school books, uh, 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 texts, um, anything is possible. Um, and the optimization depends on the medium of distribution. Uh, so you have to really think about, OK, where do I want this data to, to end up? And how should I? Um, um, more of the outputs to to fit those purposes. Um, then also mobilization can apply to legacy materials besides new projects. So ideally, uh, new projects should, should take into account the last step of mobilization, which is essential as we have seen um, when creating the recordings, when doing the annotations to create, um, to do it in a way that makes it able to export subtitles in the end and um, and also um, have the right associations of files. Um, but for many projects, uh, these were, were done in the past and uh, we didn't know the current methods and, and uh, opportunities to, to get those outputs um, back to the community. Um, so in our view, um, uh, this also applies to uh, legacy materials. So there is so much valuable stuff that is out there and that's just waiting to to be shared with people because we know it's going to be very valuable for them. Yeah, and those materials in the archive, they are open access and they can be mobilized by anyone and the archive should, in our opinion, facilitate this. Um, and then also the archive should take into account uh, mobilization. So having those subtitle files readily available as we have shown, yeah. Okay, thank you very much for listening. Uh, these are our references and we'd love to hear your thoughts. Thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, lots of food for thought, I think. Um, let's see if there's any questions from the audience. Uh, Bonnie raised her hand. Hi, thanks so much for the talk, guys. I did put another reference in the chat for you. Uh, oh, great, so thanks. I I agree with you that this the step of mobilization is really important. Um, I'm glad you mentioned Hamar not having electricity. That's certainly the case of a lot of places where I work, where we uh, decided to make, say we have a phone app and all the uh, dictionary sound files associated with the phone app are downloadable so that people can use that mobile phone app even when they're offline. And, you know, so I'm talking about communities with no access to TV or uh, things like that. Um, so, yeah, that's the first point that, yeah, the, the what you were saying about knowing your community's means of access is certainly very important. Uh, but that sometimes that means compressing the data in a way that feels uncomfortable to a linguist, right? Um, so the other, I guess, main point I want to make is that Okay, so I've been involved with a number of uh, projects and they're all very difficult to find um, through Google. And I think what is really needed is funding. You know, right now, ELAR prioritizes putting things in the archive. They do not prioritize mobilization as you're talking about. But you're, when you're asking linguists to take on an extra step that isn't just dumping videos on YouTube or TikTok, which is a great idea, actually. Um, 
there has to be some way to sort of get credit for all that work that you're doing. Now, one of the projects I've been involved with uh, is um, this uh, Hugh Brody collection of uh, videos made with the uh, um, new speakers or Komani. Um, and basically it involved a lot of external funding and librarians. I mean, librarians are the people that know how to connect people to data, right? So they also get credit for creating these sorts of access points. And, um, you know, it's not obvious from this website, but my colleague Carrie Jones has actually gone and into the community and held workshops on how to use this website. Um, so I guess that would be my, my one point is to, you know, talk to librarians and uh, but then maybe the, another point is to put pressure on ELAR to actually make this a more salient thing that they do. Because, I mean, for the second time in, in as many years, I've had a depositor tell me, I have trouble accessing my ELAR files. It'll take me a while. So we're not even talking about ELAR being difficult for community members. It's difficult for linguists, as you've seen. Yeah, great As, thank you so much. yeah, thanks. Thanks again for your talk. I'll just, I'll just uh, end my comments there. No, that's an interesting point. And um, what you say is that um, mobilization is not prioritized by uh, by ELAR in in these projects. They want people to dump their files into the archive and. It can end there as far as they are concerned. But then we also saw that in their community uh, or in their uh, guidelines for projects that um, they do say that there should be a budget for um, for uh, mobilization. So let's go back to that slide. I think it was here. Yeah, but from what I've seen, well, that budget yeah. would have to be almost as big as the, the initial documentation budget if you want to do it really, really well. And, you know, until we have access to that sort of funding, that sort of time commitment, you know, it just feels like yet another thing as a linguist. Ah, oh, you need to become a programmer. You need to become a videographer. You know, it's <laughs> there are other people who specialize in these things. That's not necessarily the best use of a linguist's time. I, no. I should say that from my, uh, sorry guys, I have a little bit of a cold. Um, I should say that from my personal experience, ELAR, yes, encourages, you have the slide here, that's great, encourages the, uh, the um, uh, creation of outputs. But in the, uh, in the budgeting section, uh, at least when I was doing it, and this was when they were based in the UK, out of the, uh, out of the budget that you make, uh, there were two thousand pounds that you could put towards uh, community mobilization. Yeah, so in comparison to the entire amount, two thousand pounds. I mean, it depends on how you use it, right? But I don't want to take up uh, too much space. But uh, two thousand pounds uh, goes pretty quickly when you're doing this kind of work. <laughs> uh, right, yeah. barely covers the captioning it, once the linguist has made the a transcription. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we totally see the issue, and this is something we'd actually discussed before as well. And uh, maybe something yet to highlight that we really tried in this presentation to uh, steer away from these uh, expensive and time consuming uh, solutions. So we really tried to put our things on, uh, put our emphasis on things that you probably have the descriptions for the videos already. A lot of the things you probably have to create just for your own use as a linguist. And also, we did not say create apps or things that really need a specific step. So we try to make it as convenient as possible. So minimum effort, but maximum results, <laughs> so to say. Marta, you have your hand first. Uh, yes, I love the presentation and I have so much to, uh, to say, to comment on. Um, so I'll try not to do that. Um, for the last, I, I, I loved it except for the very last bit when you were talking about the archive uh, to the mobilization. Um, because what I really uh, see the value in the whole presentation is, is that, uh, okay, we um, think about how to make this uh, material uh, to let it live. And the archive is an archive. 
Uh, and I think there's a lot of, but that Eli is also basically that and Dobes as well. And they try to make it more like a museum, but uh, where you uh, enjoy looking at things, but that gives the confusion that they would also try to make it uh, really like the, the place where people are mobilized. So I I think this step is needed. What 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 you um, presented here that that there's another activity uh, thinking about ways to to share uh, the the materials in all sorts of ways and uh, and in 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 my <laughs> approach it will always be uh, doing from legacy material eh, like mine because I mean uh, you will do it uh, it will continue to to do it after after you've collected the data and the older you get the more time there will be uh, because you will continue to to work on things I mean the, the first uh, outlet that I did was already in 1988 where we had a manda mano where, where we had a uh, in in the Van der Werf Park in Leiden, where we reenacted the Iraqi stories, and, uh, and and now you are still working with that material, so um, I'm happy with it that that it is inevitable that 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 we are uh, that we have not projected in advance how to. Uh, how to bring the material into uh, in, into the eyes of 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 everybody it and um it will uh, i think you have to keep trying and keep failing and keep trying again and see what you can um and and keep in mind that for, i wouldn't put that much emphasis on dopes and 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 Eilard because after all these are endangered languages and and so I can never get my material into ELA because I can simply can't pay for that. It's too expensive. Even if they would accept it, because they won't accept it, because Iraqu is is not an endangered language. So uh, I think there's all sorts of material that is. Uh, I, th I think it's probably under your legacy material uh, that uh, that that can be used, and I'm very happy. Uh, that you say that 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 you enjoy working with it, and I can see that in the presentation, and and that more students might enjoy working with it, and and I think we have to find ways where where we can let people just just work with them, and and it's now it is you, it's you in the tech savvy Western world, but uh, the 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 people that we are talking to in Tanzania or wherever they are getting more and more tech savvy and and they do all sorts of things that I even I find uh, impossible for myself so I have I you are working on my Iraqu material because I continue to have a link with the Iraqu and and that is but I have other materials I've conso I have all sorts of stuff where I would love uh, to to dump them indeed in a place in an archive where where hopefully people in console area see what it is and just go ahead with it do it themselves uh, we have to i think that that will be uh the next steps that that uh, it's all out of our hands it should be like that so and i've been talking far too long i think in the uh, in the um ethics uh, you're right that when it is public you can do with it what you want but uh, of course ethics is also that you think yourself in what you that you think about what you do is good it's not just whether it's legal or not ethics is first and foremost about uh, yeah that that uh, that that you uh, that you are in peace with yourself yeah, thanks, Martin. You want me to go first? Yeah, sure. Yeah, I had a lot of thoughts. So I was a bit confused by what you meant by not liking the uh, archive as a hub, because I think it's, of course, it's not the end point of mobilization. So this is not, maybe I came off 
incorrectly that, or not as I meant, that of course it's not the end point, but as you put it, the museum, that's how it works, I think, uh, quite well. And uh, just a space where people can find even more data that I, at least in my mind, sounds nice. And uh, another thing but that Nicolas, we what I what what I mean is there, and that's why I brought in that example of of the theater in in a park. There are so many ways in which you can use the data that can never be envisaged by any ELAR. So uh, so whatever ELAR does and how if they make some things better. And and I, you know me, I provoke, I provoke. So I put it in the extreme. They will never, it will never be good enough. So uh, don't don't expect solutions from a better ELAR. Yeah. And I think and if we think of ELAR as the uh, the the research library that no one ever visits, but we our mobile apps should be those those little libraries on wheels that actually go to the communities. Yes, okay. And the other thing that we actually discussed with Jeroen that didn't make the presentation, but we had ideas on, is that in the, you, as you said, like ideally the community would start doing those things as themselves. So we are imagining that maybe uh, nowadays there are community social media influencers who will be able to, who you would be able to collaborate with because they will be able to gain popularity by posting your materials. They will be happy to do that, but uh, you will be happy because it is posted by somebody who is known by the community and uh, it also reaches further. So yes, that's the ideal solution that we talked about, but didn't make the cut right now. Do you have anything to add to Erun? Yeah, so very specifically, when we had to chat with Martin and uh, and Lightness, uh, an Iraqu uh, uh, community member and speaker, um, we were thinking of the idea to to have a, a YouTube channel uh, to to publish these materials to, from where, for example, on Facebook, people can link to this channel and um, and distribute it from there. Uh, and that can be done. That doesn't have to be done by the uploaders of the of the YouTube channel. That can be done by anyone who wants to link to that channel. Um, so that can be taken over from from there by uh, by these uh, key community members who have the network. Yeah, because in the example you were talking about, uh, Lightness talked about. Yes, my sister has a great following on Facebook, and if she posts them, they will get good visibility. So, yeah, always know who. Who can help and who is interested in? Yeah. Well, first of all, thank you for the talk, Nicholas and your own. Um, it's nice to uh, to hear sort of a. Uh, it's nice to hear sort of like an interpretation from two full digital natives. I was reading the other day, and I'm apparently what they would call an elder millennial at this point. So <laughs> I'm apparently. <laughs> I'm I'm apparently past that. Um, I noticed that there was. I have a lot to say. Obviously, I think that we've all had the lots to say. Um, I noticed that kind of your gold standard was a subtitled video, uh, at least uh, in one or two languages with the subtitles burned in. I'm. I wanted to know. Do I interpret that correctly? And if so, why? Mm. I have other stuff to say, but that's my first one. Yeah. Yeah. So um, we think there's value in having burnt in subtitles. Yes. Um, at least for one language, because there can be a technical difficulty with people and uh, knowing how to uh, turn on these subtitles, or even when these materials are transferred to uh, like other platforms, if they're downloaded from YouTube, people will not always get those subtitles that are not burned in. Uh, so they can get lost. So therefore, it's it's good to have those be part of, th of the video file. Um, of course, you um, there's value in having more languages available as subtitles. And you don't want everything to be burned in. So uh, I think there's a balance between choosing which language to burn into your video and choosing which ones to make available uh, externally to uh, to have the option to turn them on. 
Um, and yeah, so this is a, a choice that we have to make uh, of which languages to choose for which purpose. Um, but yes, that is our gold standard uh, because in that case, uh, in that way to have subtitles available, it can cater to uh, to more people, right? You reach more people with that. Maybe um, people from outside the community who don't speak the language anymore, who benefit from having translations under the video, uh, but also the transcriptions. Um, but I also think, now that you mention it, that, um, for example, in your archive, you have a lot of videos that don't have any transcription or translation. You have like 1,300. Um, and of course, those will also be very valuable to be put on, on YouTube or wherever so that people in the community can watch them. And they don't necessarily need those subtitles in order to make use of the videos. Um, but then I think if that's all dumped into one channel, you can get lost into um, in which videos you know uh, you can expect subtitles for and which don't have them. Um, because, yeah, people will be searching for videos with subtitles and others might not really care about that. So um, these are just some considerations to take into account when, uh, when thinking of choosing for subtitles and how to distribute those. Nicholas, yeah. anything to add? Yeah, I wanted to add to that, that, uh, <clears throat> well, we didn't really propose YouTube as the archive, right? And uh, we <clears throat> also discussed your case extensively when uh, making this presentation. And uh, it's perfectly reasonable to not have all the stuff uh, subtitled. But if you mobilize it, then you really just need to know whether your community needs to have the subtitles for the data to be useful to them or uh, not. And uh, another thing that I just came to my mind, once again, you have the thumbnail uh, if it's a YouTube video. And there you can include uh, English subtitles included or no subtitles. Uh, so already the person is aware what they can expect from uh, clicking on the video. Yeah. My, uh, <clears throat> I'll do one follow up, and then I have maybe a comment that you guys might want to respond to. But my follow up is sort of the the framing of getting this stuff out of mobilizing, and I, a lot of it has been well, we need to try and get it out to as many people as possible. This sort of wide. Uh, this sort of wide access. My, I guess sort of my, my, my question is, have we thought about like the various reasons as to why we might want to mobilize our data? Now I know that like the, the very first step is to ask the community as to why you might want to mobilize your data. But part of me is thinking, well, if we want to mobilize our data to, for example, encourage language learning, we'd probably, the data would probably need to be of a certain type and it would need to be done in a certain format, right? Because sitting down, you know, linguists, we might find this very interesting, sitting down and listening to natural speech, subtitled natural speech. I don't know if that's optimized for learning or relearning a language, for example. Uh, mobilizing for community awareness. I mean, maybe laying, maybe just sort of, like you said, getting all this stuff on YouTube, maybe that's what you need for community awareness, just so they know that the videos are out there. And that can go a long way, just for people to know that there's that material and for people to connect to the stuff that's been recorded. But maybe, you know, maybe this stuff is, you know, I, I, I read an article just a few, maybe it was about a year ago now, but it was about a, a, a musical artist back home where I was born in Newfoundland in Canada. And uh, we have a very, well, we had a very sort of um, vibrant uh, folk music uh, scene. You know, a lot of the communities uh, on the island were only reachable by boat. So you had a lot of these different communities would develop different sort of traditions and sub-traditions. And there was uh, a fellow who went around and documented some of this stuff in the 60s. This was before the cod mor moratorium and before the, the highways came down and changed a lot of these communities. And before resettlement had moved a lot of these, had emptied a lot of these communities out. A lot of these places are ghost towns now. 
But the story was, so all this stuff had been archived, and the story was this traditional musician had been going into the archives in the, in the provincial museum, and he had been drawing on some of these uh, recordings to uh, make new songs. He was making new songs out of these old traditional songs that had died out, and they were put into his album. So the idea of the archive of being a wellspring, a resource for people a hundred years in the future who might want to create, uh, a, a, you know, like a like a um a livelihood based on on their culture or the culture that was that of their of their predecessors. You know, I mean, there's a million different ways that we could think of or conceive of how this stuff will be used. And some of which, like we, you know, we could sit down in this room and chat together. We we wouldn't be able to come up with them all. So like Martin says, we have no idea how these things will 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 go in the future. So I think that, yeah, I think that the idea of what are we mobilizing for, I think, uh, I think is important. I don't know if you, I, I have one thing to say after that, but I, I, I want to leave a second to see if you guys have responses or thoughts uh okay yeah <clears throat> we did not discuss <clears throat> we did discuss this uh, somewhat as well and uh, we once again thought that uh, you just have to know the community about for what they actually want so if the, for example it's a community which has a lot of members have left for the cities to uh, learn new jobs uh, or to get a job, then maybe a useful thing is, for example, if it's instructions to recipes and then they remember something that their parents were doing and then they are able to recreate this. And once again, also if it's uh, a white community, then uh, the an instruction for a recipe could be interesting in another way if they uh, leave comments that, oh, actually my parents or my mother or grandmother used to do it this way, this is completely wrong. And then someone else says like, oh, I do it also in this third way. So they could be sort of hubs for discussion, but yeah, it depends completely on the community. So I very much agree with your points that you brought up. Jeroen? Yeah, I think uh, Andrew makes a good point that um, just having these materials in the archive uh, can, it can it can lead to endless ways of of using those materials for for any purpose that no one could ever think of now. Um, but the value is that these materials are recorded now and they're stored now, and um, and we can never know the value of them uh, uh, in in a hundred years, in two hundred, three hundred years, uh, maybe more. Um, so there is is the value of having as much in the archive as possible and nothing needs to be uh not everything needs to be annotated of course but if um if there is a need um well alar languages are uh archives in alar are on endangered languages so there is a certain urge for those to uh to be mobilized um and maybe the languages are not um, uh, widely spoken anymore. Uh, so then there's a lot of added value in having those subtitles and uh, having them on the right platforms to reach people, um, not in a hundred years from now, but now. Yeah. My uh, My final comment is I don't want to sound like a naysayer, but I do have questions because sometimes when I see recordings of traditional languages, now, of course, I have a very sort of, you know, a very specific sort of context. So working in Tanzania, but again, of course, we're at the Rafali Network, so this is probably shared. Often when I see in sort of on the internet, when I see on Facebook or when I see on TikTok, examples of local language being used. I often see it used in these contexts as the butt of jokes. So there is a video that's very, very famous now of a group of about five or six Hadza people giving their names. There's a, there's a recording and there's somebody passing around a, a phone and saying, tell us your name. 
and they all say their names, you know, their names that were given to them and that are unique and that they use to identify themselves, odds and names. And uh, it's, it, there are several different versions, but it, there's always somebody, you know, sort of wide mouthed, you know, are these names, can they really be, can they really be names? There's often laughter sort of tracked in on the, on the back, this idea that, oh, look at these people and this language is incomprehensible. Um, it's the framing, right? So the recording itself, the original recording, I mean, all the people are standing up, they're saying their names uh, clearly in good faith that this recording will be used in a good way. And a year later, they're the butt of jokes. Now, uh, I, I don't want to be pessimistic about this, but we all know that Tanzanian languages that are not Swahili and that are not English exist in a climate in which many people would like to see them wiped off the face of the earth. Many people would. They're opposite to uh, national progress. So I'm not saying that there are people going out and you know, and, and, and eradicating these languages actively, but they certainly exist in a larger national uh, sort of climate in which many people think that these are jokes. These aren't real languages. They're funny. They're, they're, they're dumb. They're spoken by people who are, you know, who are second rate citizens. And so the, it's easy to turn them into the butt of jokes. I translated a song, beautiful song, uh, that was put into an anthology of poems. And every time I, I, I give it to the students here, so we're not even talking about Tanzania anymore, but when I give it to the students, they'll often laugh because one of the refrains is, uh, it's, a, it's a man singing to a girl. One of the refrains is, come with me and we will collect manure. And people will laugh and they'll say, well, this is a weird way to like encourage a woman to come with you. But Martin, of course, will nod his head and, and people who are familiar with the area will know that this is one of the most important parts of, of Gorwa, you know, of a Gorwa household is the dried manure. And to invite somebody to go and do that is really sort of saying, you know, come along with me on this lifelong journey and we're going to build a household and we're going to encourage fertility. Um, and it might be mundane, but it's one of these sort of beautiful things. But so unless you know the context, unless you know the framing, these things can be interpreted or misinterpreted in a variety of ways, and they can be recruited to violent assimilationist ends. And my question is, and I don't know if this is answerable, but maybe it's something for you guys to think about and for all of us to think about. When we're mobilizing, are there things that we can build in to the data that we mobilize so it is not misused by people who have assimilationist agendas, by fascists, by racists? How do we do it? Are there ways in which we can frame the data that we're mobilizing to avoid that? That's all I have to say. Yeah, thanks, Andrew. Uh, that's definitely something to think about and it's a good point that these data can be used also by people who don't have the best intentions um yeah i think i think there's two two steps there first is of course um the the step of recording what do you decide to record uh and you might not want to record everything if you know um that something might be very sensitive um maybe not just within the community but also to people outside of the community um but i don't know if that should let uh should hold people back because as you say with this um song about uh, collecting dried manure that's that's a beautiful thing within Gorwa community but outside of uh the community um people can indeed make fun of that so then the question is okay you do want to record it um maybe you want to assign a different access rights in that case um but then the real question is how do you want to mobilize this this output uh where do you want to publish it and 
who do you think it will reach? Um, and indeed, we should keep those those questions in mind. Um, how it could eventually be misused, but for me, that's very hard to to make an estimate of. Um, I don't know if you have something to say about the Nicholas or anyone else. Yeah, I. So my hunch is uh, I don't have an answer, but I have an answer of I think you can go either two ways. So yes, one of the ways is you restrict the content, uh, but <clears throat> I feel like that could also have a very largely negative effect if you, because if you have all this great uh, data or great videos that show the how beautiful the Hatsa people are and how beautiful their culture is, and then if the only video, if you look up, you can find this the, uh, video where people are mocking them, then this does not leave a good representation. So my hunch would be to go the other way. <clears throat> and of course, yes, restrict some of it, but really to mobilize the good data to have the mobilize the things that are also able to educate people and show the people the beauty of the culture and i feel like that can have a better effect and that maybe that will also uh, hide the negatively used things more so this is what i'm hoping for in an ideal world but things don't always work out of course but yeah so if they if they search for hadza they don't find that video first they find they find the Hatsa <laughs> documentary materials first. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me up now? Sorry. Just a quick uh, <laughs> response to Andrew. That that video I've seen of Hadza saying their names, they're actually making fun of the tourists. They're totally making up names. They're saying, my name is Rock, Hunt Kako, and <laughs> things that there clearly aren't their names. Making up names. Yeah. Yeah. But that just have a lot of clicks in them. And, and yeah, people, but people watching that video aren't going to know that context. Um, yeah. So my uh, question was, uh, how can we mobilize legacy data where the linguist who originally collected it maybe is not in anymore. So where we really don't know the local community, you know, what what would that be? And and uh, echoing some of Andrew's points about being concerned about misuse, I have to say that at a number of uh, companies approach me and uh, Carrie Jones about our new data, oh, we want to help you transcribe it. We are using AI to transcribe languages to governments to spy on their own people. <laughs> you know, this is real. This is happening. Uh, uses of data that we would have never foreseen. And when you make all this stuff like really annotated, Google and other corporations can just suck up that data and use it to train their transcribers and put it to ends that you know nobody ever gave ethical approval for. You know, once that's on YouTube, it's transcribed, that can be sucked. I think, yeah, Bonnie, you're a little bit uh, garbled at the end, but I think that you mainly came through. I don't know if you guys have, have, have thoughts on that. Yeah, there was a little a bit of beep boop, so I didn't catch everything. Um, I think uh, you, you talked about um, uh, these big companies sucking up all the data, um, including the transcriptions, to create these models of the language to uh, to make it so that they can be automatically transcribed. Um, that might not be too far in the future. This can be done for very good purposes, but as you say, it might also be misused. But I think in that case, uh, we're not talking about mobilization anymore because these materials are in the archive and it can can be sucked up from there. Uh, it doesn't matter whether it's on YouTube or not. So I don't think, well, I don't see right now how that would be relevant to mobilization specifically rather than just having materials in the archive uh, at all. Yeah, I agree with Jeroen that I think it's an issue, but there's also the thing that if these languages become uh, very vital and if the communities, for example, modernize, then it is inevitable. They may not want this, but also if they want to modernize, then they have to eat that part of the cake as well. It's, uh, yeah, it's difficult. Yeah, but just for me as a linguist, I don't want to help them. <laughs> 
I, I agree. I agree. I completely agree. Yeah, but still they can they can access your data if it's open access in the archive, right? So you don't need to give them access specifically for that. Or yeah. do you understand that incorrectly? Yeah, mobilization is not going to be changing that, I think. Yeah. If I can jump in there, it is an extra step, as you already found out. It is quite difficult to sort of automize exporting that kind of data from the archive, which is our problem with mobilization. Whereas on YouTube, if you have a scraper that does it automatically, that makes it much more susceptible to those kind of things. Yeah, but a lot of these things, the, they are just looking for new pages they can scrape. And if they find like, oh, this is like, this is the ALAR, and uh, they just teach the AI that these are the things that you need to click to open the things up, I think it would be able to find the data that it wants. It would be able to scrape it itself. I don't think it would be, I think it would be easier to scrape the data than to look look at it manually for ALAR. Yeah, so this is the thing where um, people are technically able to access those materials on a language and community members, for example, to find them in the archive, but actually in practice, no one is going to end up there. and. I think the point here is that it might be the same for AI, that if it's on YouTube, it's easy to find and scrape. Um, but if it's in the archive, maybe less so, but still, uh, technically, it should be possible if people really have those intentions. So I don't know if there is much for us to to do there. That's my stance on it. Go ahead, Bonnie. Oh, just a couple of days ago on Linguist List, there was a, a by someone taking all the uh, recordings from JIPA's uh, illustrations of the IPA, ending that, and they, for uh, an automatic transcriber that they're going to be charging money for, you know, I don't know that that was ever, you know, as that people never <laughs> agreed for their data for the for illustrations of the IPA to be used for a commercial purpose, and yet, and that, there we have it. You know, I, I think we as linguists need to be concerned about the. the these uses of our data that were never intended. But should it then concern our choice of access rights, who we are sharing it with? Where do we where do we make that step to limit the data to the people yeah, who, who can access it? In licensing. Licensing. Correctly. Yeah. Andrew? Uh I should say, um, I know that we're getting a little bit long in time, but I know that we're we're all people who are interested in documentation and outputs. Um, and obviously we could go we could go on and on, but I, I'm just thinking, I mean, I think that this is a great sort of start here. I think that you guys are onto something and I think it would be really interesting if you continued with this idea a little bit. I'd like to encourage you to look a little bit more throughout some of the literature on different types of mobilization. I don't know if anybody has done like a like an exhaustive look through some of the some of the stuff that's been published. I know that my colleague Richard Griscom uh, would share things with me occasionally. He'd say, look at what they're doing in such and such a place. He shared something with me called the jukebox archive method. Uh, a couple of years ago, and this was the example of a, of a language community in, in Mexico. And the way that they mobilized some of their data was they took an old computer and they just filled it to the brim with recordings. And that computer just stayed there in that place, I guess maybe a community center, and it contained a subset of chosen recordings from the larger archive. And people could just go in and it was easy. They could just access the uh, the recordings and open them up and listen to them. So I think that that was really cool. And I'm sure that there's like a whole spectrum of different stuff. And I think it would be super interesting and, and exciting. Um, and I think it would add a lot to, um, to sort of this really good foundation that you guys have set to sort of look at um, some of these different types of, uh, of mobilization that might be... Uh, that people have tried in different places. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for that suggestion. I, yeah, I, I'd love to, uh, to compile, uh, a list of all the ways possible to, to share this data. 
um, as, as Martin's presentation, where we started from, uh, was titled 50 Ways to Share My Record Data. And I think it would include such a, such a method uh, and many more. But in this presentation, of course, we focused on the digital uh, distribution. Um, but yes, there are many more ways, and we'd love to explore those as well. Thanks. Maybe as a comment, it's just uh, we also would have maybe liked to look at more, have liked to look at more examples, but it was also very difficult to find them. So a lot of the information we got about the mobilization was just from the blog posts of uh, ALAR. That uh, once again, just looking things up on the internet doesn't really give any results. Right. Thank you. I think I am going to round up today because we are going a little bit long. Um, um, so thank you very much for the talk. And we've also had a very interesting discussion. Looking ahead, the next webinar will be on Wednesday, the 12th of June, presented by Martha Booker-Johnson. And the title of her talk will be announced in the next newsletter. Um, so with that, thank you, Yvonne and Nicholas, for the presentation. Everyone else for participating today. And I look forward to seeing you at the next webinar.